Uh, well, good, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming along to this session. Um, like Karen said, my name is uh, Andrew Lind, and I am a lecturer at the University of Highlands and Islands with the Institute of Northern Studies. Now, if I can get this slide to move, which would be a great start for us. There we go. So just before I dive into kind of the meat and bones of uh, today's talk, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I am first and foremost a historian of the British Civil Wars, and like Karen said, most of my research up to this point has focused on Scottish royalism. So anyone who isn't aware of what Scottish royalism is, it's basically the guys and gals who came out in support of Charles I and Charles II during the Civil War period. Now, specifically, I look at uh, royalists in Scotland, but I do look at interactions across the three kingdoms, which is a point which I'll come back to in just a wee second. But what makes uh, or, or gives me a little bit of an insight into the kind of topics which you guys are teaching in the classroom is that I was formerly a tutor of National Five Higher and Advanced Higher History. Um, I did that all the way through my PhD, and it wasn't so long ago that I did my own uh, Higher and Advanced Higher. So uh, I can just about remember what the remit was. So hopefully um, that's given me a little bit more of an insight into how we can transition these really complex topics into the higher classroom. So what I'd like to do today is roughly I'll talk for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then what I'm really keen on is having a discussion with you all about this topic and any issues which you've come across or any resources which you'd particularly like to get. So I'll start off by looking at the key issues according to the, the SQA guidelines and talk a little bit about recent developments in the scholarship on those topics. I'll then shift focus a little bit more generally to discuss a couple um, digital resources, which I think uh, would be very useful for teaching this in the class. And I'll discuss a number of digital primary source resources, which are really quite incredible. And there's a lot of stuff there, which I think would, could be used very easily within the higher history module. I'm now going to do a very shameless plug of my own work and discuss very briefly about how I think that might be used uh, within the, the class as well. And then we'll shift to that open discussion and we can hopefully have a bit of a chat about all of this. So without any further ado, let's, uh, let's just remind ourselves of the key issues according to the SQA guidelines. Because I don't know about you guys, I've only had one coffee, so I definitely need to remind myself. Uh, th there are six key issues for this module. The first of which is the reasons um, for the problems faced by James VI following his ascension to the thrones of England and Ireland in 1603. The second is an assessment of the policies of Charles I in Scotland up to 1642, i.e. the outbreak of the English Civil War. The third is an evaluation for, uh, sorry, of the reasons for the outbreak for civil war in England. The fourth is probably the most confusing, to be honest. Um, it is an evaluation of the reasons for a failure to find an alternative form of government between 1649 and 1658, i.e. after the execution of Charles I and the establishment of the Cromwellian Commonwealth. And uh, key issues five and six shift focus within the chronology towards the so-called glorious revolution. And number five is an evaluation for the reasons for the revolution settlement of 1688-89. And issue six is an assessment of the significance of the changes brought about by the revolutionary settlement. So when I was putting these slides together, um, just a couple of uh, thoughts that came to me was first and foremost, the this is obviously a, a British module, but my feeling personally is that this is incredibly Anglo-centric in terms of how it's structured and how it's taught. And uh, that, that obviously isn't any, a fault of anyone here, but just, I think that's something to keep in mind, especially with the way that the scholarship on all of these topics has developed. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a wee second, because it does seem to be very much uh, the story of England's uh, century of revolutions with a little bit of attention paid to Scotland in the earlier part. And there, there really is no um, discussion of Ireland at all in this period. I know that it comes up in uh, key issue three for one of the background reasons to, uh, behind the English Civil Wars. But uh, really this is very much an English history module um, which has been kind of labeled with British history. And I think that's quite problematic and we will come back to that in just a few seconds. The second point to note is that um, I am um, commenting upon this as a Scottish historian of Ireland Scotland, which is probably why I think it's so Anglo-centric. Um, but that's just something to, to keep in mind when I go through the, the key issues and I'll flag a, a lot of work which has been really important within the field of Scottish history, uh, but might not have been you know, as 
uh, prevalent within the wider kind of scholarly view, but I'll, I'll point those kind of works out as we go along. The third point is that I just think everyone should give themselves a round of applause for teaching this module because it is incredibly complex. And this is not a, a topic that is particularly easy to teach to higher history students. Um, I do, however, think that is an incredibly important module, unsurprisingly. And uh, I would argue, no, no matter what the medieval, medieval say, sorry, uh, that this is very much the period where modern Britain is built. And so it's incredibly important that our young people have at least a kind of broad understanding of this century and all the events which made it up. So let's look at these key issues in a little bit more detail. So what we'll do now is I'll just break down each of these key issues and kind of flag some of the key scholarly developments. So that first key issue, looking at James VI and the Union of the Crowns in 1603, and specifically the, the course uh, descriptors want students to think about the problems which James VI and his government encountered post-1603. And that actually quite you know, mirrors the, the central scholarly debates on this topic very nicely, because this is probably the one topic where there hasn't been a huge kind of redrawing of lines in terms of scholarly debate. And the, the topics of debate for this topic have remained the same for probably 20, 30 years now. And those central debates are what the impact of so-called absentee monarchy was on Scotland, this idea of how did the Scottish political state adapt to the fact that their king, who James VI was king of Scotland before he took up the thrones of England and Ireland in 1603, how did they adapt to the fact that James basically picked up sticks, went down the road to London and actually only returned once during the, the rest of his reign? So how did the Scottish political state adapt to that? Linked to that, um, another central debate, which has been reinvigorated in recent years, it has to be said, was how rigidly was uh, James VI's British policies of uniformity pursued? Uh, this got a, a little bit of a kind of lip service paid to it during the independence referendum in 2014. And that there's a few topics uh, on, on this module which uh, were reignited during that period for obvious reasons. And there's been a lot of scholarly work done on that and about you know, how seriously James actually wanted to pursue uniformity across all three of his kingdoms. A really good work, if anyone's interested in this, is uh, Sharon Adams wrote a paper on the Middle Shires for uh, Julian Goodair's Scotland in the Age of Revolutions collection. And she looked at uh, basically the border regions which James tried to convert from the borders to what he called the Middle Shires and uses that as a case study to explore this uh, pursuit of uniformity. Now, possibly the most recent development in, in this topic is the shifting of the discussion towards more general attitudes to the Union of the Crowns after 1603. And uh, that's always been a, a topic of debate within the Scottish scholarship, but more recently it's been picked up within the Irish and English scholarship as well. And that produces a lot of interesting points which um, could be very interesting to, to bring in front of the students. Things like why in Scotland was the Union of the Crowns initially very popular and then became less so? And why in England was it very, uh, it received a very mixed reception, but then gradually became more popular? The key works for this uh, topic have remained the same for some time now. Uh, if anyone wants to read up more on the Union of the Crowns, uh, I thoroughly recommend these three works, the first of which is Keith Brown's Kingdom or Province, um, which looks at the, the this whole century from a Scottish perspective, but Keith's uh, sections on the Union of the Crowns at the earlier period is really, really good. The uh, edited collection done by Glenn Burgess, uh, Ronald Weimer and Jason Lawrence, The Ascension of James I, is um, another very useful collection of scholarly works, especially for this period where you might want to have a look at and pick out some of those key uh, debates or arguments to bring out in the class. And the third, uh, Morris Lee, who is one of the leading scholars on James VI, his uh, Great Britain Solomon, really tackles this problem of post 1603 government in uh, Stuart Britain from a Three Kingdoms perspective. And that links into one of the kind of big points which I really want to drive home today is that the scholarship across the century and all the key topics has really taken on what is called either a British history approach or a Three Kingdoms approach, or it's sometimes called an archipelago approach, whereby there's been a real shift away from just doing something like an English history of the English civil wars or a Scottish history of the Covenanters. 
there's far more emphasis now within the scholarship of trying to take into account the wider picture within the British Isles. And that's largely just due, due to the realisation that the, the three kingdoms under the Stuart monarchy are so interconnected and the, the civil wars which break out and the disruptions which happen after the restoration, they're all so interlinked. There's groups in, in Scotland and England who are communicating with each other and obviously seeking the, the same uh, goals or, or religious purposes. And so that makes it really important to understand this period. And so it's really unpopular now just to do a kind of a single study of just Scotland or just England. You've really got to try and take into account what's happening across the British Isles. Now, the other important development within scholarship on James VI is a little bit of revisionism. Now, this is always popular for uh, monarchs, especially Scottish monarchs, where basically we debate whether they were any good or not. But James VI has had a really mixed uh, history and he's gone from being regarded in older scholarship as a bit useless to during the kind of the revisionist phase during the 1990s led by people like Jenny Wormald there was a revision of James's successes and actually people like Jenny Wormald and Morris Lee argued that James was a very successful king perhaps more successful as a king of Scotland than uh, of Great Britain but nonetheless a successful king but more recently especially linking to the debates surrounding the causes of the English Civil War, there has been a reassessment of that and there has been suggestions that perhaps the policies which James VI brought into place played a far greater role in the outbreak of the English Civil War than has been previously acknowledged. And again, that's one of those key debates which fits really nicely into the course descriptors for this module and especially this key issue. Now, the second key issue looks at Charles I and his relationship with Scotland, especially focusing in on his political and religious policies. And um, this is obviously um, a topic which I, I know quite a lot about, but I'm, not, I'm going to try not to go off on tangents here. But the central debates have um, really focused on three big issues, the first of which is a political uh, issue and discussions over the, the development of Scottish political ideology up to 1630 and uh, after it. And basically what that debate focuses on is um, what were attitudes to the Stuart kingship in Scotland, what were attitudes to alternative forms of governance, and what were attitudes towards some kind of constitutional understanding of government in Scotland. And this has got quite a long legacy, looking at the works of people like George Buchanan, who some of you might be uh, familiar with, and basically how did Scots understand the political state around them and how did they justify political power? So that's a really important, uh, quite large uh, debate within the field. There's also the debate over whether there was a revolution in Scotland. And this is a debate which often rears its head every couple of years. Um, if anyone's interested in this kind of angle in their teaching, there was recently a podcast series on the podcast Pax Britannica, where the host Sam Hume uh, got a number of leading scholars to come on and talk about this, uh, talk about their research and talk about this debate. So that's a potentially a useful resource for the class as well. The other big development within this topic is the degree of support for the covenanting and royalist causes in Scotland, because up until quite recently, it was understood that um, the, the covenanting movement in Scotland was more or less universally supported to varying degrees, and that the, the royalist um, cause in Scotland was very unpopular, quite regionalised. And I hope that my, my own work has, has challenged that, but also the work of other people like Chris Langley, um, who's really, and, and Laura Stewart, who have really kind of shown that there was division across Scotland throughout the various levels of society. And so you can get quite an interesting discussion going in classes about, you know, what were the reasons for supporting the Covenanters, what were the reasons for supporting uh, the Royalists, and look at different area case studies, uh, which I'll come back to in just a second, about, you know, how did local uh, areas react to the outbreak of civil wars in Scotland. In terms of core works, there really is one core textbook for the civil war period in Scotland, and that is David Stevenson's The Scottish Revolution, 1637-44. Uh, it is an amazing book. David Stevenson is uh, an incredibly talented historian who's done a lot of really, you know, path leading uh, work. It is not particularly accessible for higher students, I would, I would say, but uh, for yourselves, if you want to look into this more uh, thoroughly, that's definitely the place to start. Uh, if you're looking at more kind of thematic or um, uh, kind of more focused studies of, of Scotland in this period, 
I would thoroughly recommend Chris Langley's Eid collection, which I was lucky enough to contribute to the National Covenant in Scotland, which looks at a range of different topics, which again, you can have a look at and see if any of them jump out to you, which you can use in the class. And Laura Stewart's recent uh, book, Rethinking the Scottish Revolution, which um, is an excellent book. It's a little bit more kind of high view uh, scholarly debate. So you might have to be a little bit more picky when you're going through that, but it is a, a fantastic book and really summarizes a lot of the the big developments within the scholarship on this topic. In terms of new uh, perspectives, like I mentioned, there is basically the full scale conversion of the scholarship on the Civil War period, no matter which uh, kingdom you're looking at, to take into consideration the interconnected nature of the conflicts, whether that be in Scotland between 1638 and 39, or the Irish um, rebellion in 1641, or the outbreak of Civil War in England in 1642. Another really important development is that there has been a shift away from kind of high level politics within scholarship to a much more of a focus on popular politics and participation. I, you know, how did everyday people experience the civil wars? What did they think about the conflict? Did they have any, you know, political ideologies or, or specific religious beliefs which made them view the wars in a certain way? And that's uh, led to really great scholarship on the development of competing identities, especially competing covenanting identities in Scotland, where actually what was a covenanter is a very contentious issue. And you, you find that certain people think they are covenanters, but actually have very different beliefs uh, to others who identify the same way. So this is something that people like Chris Langley, but also Jamie McDougall have worked on and suggested that there, there is different versions of covenanting in Scotland in this period. And this is very frustrating from the Royalist perspective because they basically uh, argue that there's a hard core leading the country astray. The third topic is the outbreak of civil war, but what it really means is the outbreak of the English civil war. And everyone who's, who's looked at this topic before or taught on this topic will know that there, it's really dominated by a central debate as to you know, what was the trigger of the English civil war and whether that was a kind of more immediate circumstantial trigger or whether it was the so-called long road to war where there was a build-up of issues along the way. That links into a, you know, a related debate over whether there was just the one cause or whether it was a cocktail of causes. It used to be the, the belief that it was largely religious or largely class and this kind of social political, but more recently the along with a kind of lot of revisionist scholarship on this period, people have kind of taken a step back and kind of realized that, you know, perhaps there's lots of things going on here and we can't just peg it to a handful of reasons and that we need to be a little bit more open-minded there. A really interesting debate, and especially one which might be useful to bring into the class, is the, the different motives to take up arms. And again, you can compare this to what's going on in Scotland, because in England it is very different. There is a very different political and religious atmosphere in England at this in this period. And that can produce quite interesting conversations about, you know, how the different civil wars were perceived and, you know, actually just were different when you're looking across the three kingdoms and yet so interconnected. In terms of core works, uh, Michael Braddock's uh, recent book, uh, God's Fury, England's Fire, is really probably, I would say, at least the kind of the current leader in terms of a history of the English civil wars. However, it is very Anglo-centric and very focused on the English picture. That's why I would perhaps suggest, and I'll come back to these two works uh, later on, that if you're interested in, in getting into this topic or, or looking at it from a Three Kingdoms perspective, or, or at least you're... Or, sorry, or offering this to students to, to read. There's two books which do this far better, I would argue, and that's Ian Gentle's English Revolution and the, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms and Tim Harris's Rebellion. Ian Gentle's book and Tim Harris's book, are, I'll come back to them in just a wee second, but they are very accessible, especially Gentle's book. It is essentially a textbook. So I, can, I could very much see that being used as a signed reading for classes and things like that. In terms of use perspectives within the scholarship, um, like, the, the situation on, on the Scottish uh, civil wars, there has been a massive shift towards kind of more popular developments within the civil wars, what were popular politics, and a move away from the kind of old school uh, depictions of the civil wars as a class conflict or a purely religious conflict. Again, this is a product of kind of revisionism scholarship where people have taken a step back and kind of viewed that we can't just apply large frameworks to historical problems. We've got to be a little bit more cognizant of the subtleties of what's going on on the ground. English scholarship has also become far more aware of what's going on 
in Scotland and Ireland in this period and far more cognizant of that interconnected nature. And again, this is a product of the so-called British history. And interestingly for this course as well, there has been a lot more discussion surrounding, you know, how surprising was the, the outbreak of civil war in 1642 in England and whether there was a Caroline consensus before that period. And again, you can link that in quite nicely to the reasons for the outbreak of the civil war and whether um, Charles I was really at fault or whether there was an avalanche going on and really um, by that point it was too little too late. A key issue number four is the failure of an alternative. So essentially, this is looking at the political situation after the execution of Charles I and trying to decipher why peace wasn't secured um, and how Oliver Cromwell was able to establish himself as the more or less the dictator of the British Isles, although he uses the term uh, protector. Um, how that comes about and how the English Republic is able to so thoroughly establish itself across all three kingdoms. In turn, I mean, Cromwell is always a, an influential and very popular area uh, for scholarship, so it won't surprise you that there is a lot of work on this. In terms of more kind of central debates and more recent debates, there's been a lot more emphasis placed on Cromwell's actions in Ireland. Um, if anyone's interested in the Irish angle, both with in terms of Cromwell or in terms of the civil wars more generally, I cannot recommend highly enough Mihail uh, Osho Cruz work on Confederate Ireland and Cromwell in Ireland is really, really fantastic. And uh, there's been a lot more kind of debate as to why Cromwell is remembered in such a way in Ireland compared to his legacy in Scotland, where basically no one really remembers him, uh, or England, where he's still kind of hailed as this kind of parliamentary democratic hero or cult figure. Linked into that, there's a really interesting debate going on about the success of the Commonwealth and how actually it was able to maintain control after a decade of civil war. Now that links into the, the readings which I've suggested below, uh, especially the work of people like Francis Dow, her book on Cromwellian Scotland is excellent and it tackles this issue really well, where basically, to give away a little bit of a spoiler, Cromwell and his underlings are just incredibly good at their jobs. They just, they're able to um, organize a state very, very effectively. Now another seat, uh, a key um, central debate and one which again was sparked after 2014 and, and it continues to be an area of interest in debate is this idea of Cromwellian unionism and the success of republicanism, republicanism sorry, in the three kingdoms. Because obviously the, uh, the Cromwellian era leaves this legacy of uh, a Republican dem democratic or quasi-democratic parliamentary system in England in Scotland, that is not the legacy it leaves, and it's certainly not the legacy it leaves in Ireland. So there's this whole interesting debate about the development of unionism across the century and what impact does the Cromwellian state have upon that. In terms of the key works, uh, as alongside uh, Francis Dow's book, which I mentioned, Barry Coward's book on the Cromwellian Protectorate is probably the, the kind of one kind of overview text, which is very useful and would be very uh, useful for students. More recently, Paul Lay has released a book called Providence Lost, which is the rise and fall of Cromwell's protectorate. It is very, very good, and it summarises a lot of this new scholarship. Again, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it for, for higher students, but for yourselves, if you're interested in the topic, it's definitely worth a look. So in terms of the, the, the new perspectives, you'll be getting the sense now that a lot of this is to do with the British developments and that you know we want to be considering what's happening in all three kingdoms and not just what's happening in England. But more generally, um, there's been developments uh, looking at what life was like under the Cromwellian protectorate or, or Commonwealth. And again, this is the work of people who we've already mentioned, particularly Laura Stewart, Chris Langley, Mickey Brock and Scott Spurlock, who released um, a book on um, Cromwell in Scotland. Again, there's lots of interesting kind of sh offshoot debates here about what attitudes, particularly in Scotland and particularly of the Scottish Covenanters, what those attitudes were to Charles the first, uh, sorry, Charles the second, and how the Stuart court survived essentially while it was living in exile in uh, at first the Netherlands and then in France. If anyone um, is interested, there's also a, a In Our Time podcast which was uh, hosted by Melvin Bray, but which had Laura Stewart, Scott Spurlock and Roger Mason on it. You'll be able to get that on the, the, uh, the replay uh, online. And that had uh, that ta tackled some of these core issues as well as some of the, the topics for the earlier period. 
The fifth point um, about the reasons for the revolution settlement. So we jump forward in the chronology a little bit past the restoration and look at the so-called glorious revolution. Now, in terms of central debates, again, I don't think anything you will here will be particularly surprising. There's a renewed debate which was sparked by Alistair Rafe's, uh, sorry, Alistair Mann's uh, new book on James the Seventh and Second about basically how much was James to blame for the, the revolution or the Williamite invasion. There is, again, carrying on that debate about the development of constitutionalism or unionism within the Three Kingdoms con context. There's been quite a lot of interesting discussion about the Williamite Revolution in that. And there's, in terms of Scotland, there's a debate largely led by uh, Ian Cowan and Tim Harris as to whether the Scots were, quote, reluctant revolutionaries. And this is basically coming down to a point where, which Cowan made where he said that Scotland wasn't particularly bothered about the, the Williamite Revolution. And what actually happens is it's strong armed into the uh, English kind of fiscal state under the guise of the Union of the Crowns. Whereas Harris kind of suggests that actually there were groups in Scotland which were very pro the Williamite settlement. In terms of the core works here, um, I can't recommend highly enough Tim Harris's works. He's actually got three books which cover this entire uh, century. There's Rebellion, there's um, Restoration and Revolution. Revolution is very accessible, very easy to read, a good one for students. There's an edited collection, which is also edited by Harris and Stephen Taylor, which looks at kind of the more focused um, topics within this, especially within that kind of broader Three Kingdoms and also European context. And if anyone's looking just for a solid narrative of the Glorious Revolution, um, I'd recommend Ted Valency's book, The Glorious Revolutions, which really does give you a really nice overview. Now, a lot of the new debate, debates have already kind of um, touched upon is the, the different receptions and legacies of the, the revolution settlements. But interestingly, especially for this topic in, in the class, is that kind of different understanding of unionism and the, the debate as to how successful the Union of the Crowns actually was after 1603. And there seems to be a general consensus on the ground post 1688 that 1603 has utterly failed and that contributes to what comes next uh, surrounding the union debates and the succession crisis which is sparked in 1702. Speaking of which, um, again a lot of this stuff is things that I've already mentioned, things like um, the the, the, the union debates and the understandings of 1603. There's also interesting debates surrounding the competing cultures in the Three Kingdoms, especially in Scotland. There's been a lot of work done uh, by, by Alistair Wraith on the competing Presbyterian or Episcopalian identities in Scotland, and whether there was that long-term legacy of uh, absentee monarchy, and whether after William and Mary take the throne, in 1688, 1689, whether the Scots are basically just put back into the position that they were in post-1603. There's also a kind of more general debate, which is being discussed by people like Chris Watley, which is one of the works I've, I've cited there, about how Scotland develops under the Williamite state and after the revolution settlement, and whether or not it's basically forced into the, the, the kind of role of the poor cousin, because the English state is converted into this military superpower and the Scottish state just can't compete with that. In terms of the core works, Al McInnes's Union and Empire is a good starting point, um, it, and it, it looks at these kind of, again, a wide lens perspective of the Union debates. Daniel Zecchi's book on the Jacobites is absolutely fantastic and incredibly readable. Another one which I would uh, maybe suggest having a look at, and one which students could definitely access. And then there's Chris Watley's book about the Scots and the Union then and now. Another fantastic textbook. It's maybe a little bit more uh, sophisticated and complex, but uh, really, really useful nonetheless. In terms of new perspective, on top of the things I've already mentioned, there has been a far greater appreciation of the development of Jacobitism in all three Stuart kingdoms. So it's more and more not being just seen as a, a Scottish kind of phenomenon. Uh, there's been work done by the likes of Paul Minode on Jacobitism in England, which is really interesting, provides a lot of uh, really interesting comparisons. And again, there's a lot on things like the uh, the early union debates and whether Scotland was actually in this position of perpetual decline, which then led to the union debates after 1702, or whether that was actually not the case and whether Scotland was on the mend by the time of the succession crisis. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the fantastic developments made by the likes of uh, Karen Bowie on popular politics in this period and whether there was a developing and um, 
under jointly understood um, British constitution coming to be formed in this period or not. Now, before finishing up, I just want to very quickly uh, run through a couple general resources which I think might be useful. On the screen there, and I should say, I'll make these slides, um, I'll make sure I send these out and all the bits that are highlighted are um, hyperlinks. So you should be able to access all these resources just by clicking on them. The first one, which I really can't um, recommend enough, is the Civil Wars Project, which is uh, an enthusiast made basically database on the Civil Wars, which is it's all very well researched, all referenced, um, incredibly useful resource, very easy, easy to search, and it, all the articles in it are very short. It's a really great resource if you wanted to uh, send students off to read about any of these aspects to do with the Civil War, and it really does cover the kind of Caroline period, so 1625, all the way through to the restoration. So there's a lot of topics which it could feed into. The uh, Newcastle University and the National Centre uh, for the Civil War in England have uh, collaborated very recently to produce an online repository of uh, school resources just called the British Civil Wars. It is a bit Anglo-centric. There's a lot which, you know, it's called the British Civil Wars, but they're really just talking about English Civil Wars. But there's a lot of really useful resources there and links to things like primary sources um, and uh, classroom activities and things. There's a similar kind of uh, group of uh, resources on the National Civil War Centre's own website, including a number of uh, really interesting YouTube videos and things like that. Because at the start of the COVID pandemic, the only good thing to really come out of it is that a lot of these uh, organizations put together resource packs for teachers to use digitally so there's a lot of really good this is a really great time to be doing this uh, because there are lots of resources available the Earl of Manchester's Regiment of Foot is a reenactment organization who took it upon themselves at the start of the COVID pandemic to make uh, school resource packs now there's some of these which are a little bit simplistic um, and maybe aimed at a lower level but again they've got a few uh, transcribed primary sources and things like that. And they are in very nicely displayed digital packs. So if you go onto their website and have a look at them, there might be a few things that are of interest. There is, of course, the History and Schools Repository run by the University of Glasgow, which has links to open access journals and, and articles, um, which members of the University of Glasgow have produced and which are free to download. So uh, be sure to check them out and see if there's anything there of interest. And in case anyone isn't aware, there's also a site called JSTOR where you do need a membership to access, but JSTOR essentially allows you to search um, a huge range of published academic journals. Uh, and it's really a great resource, especially for this topic, because there's just so much scholarship on it that if you were to get uh, access to JSTOR, you could search and find quite useful things very quickly. I just want to note a couple of what I, I would think are very student accessible texts, which I've already mentioned, which are Ian Gentle's The English Civil War, uh, sorry, the, the English Revolution and the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. It's just a, it's a really solid student friendly textbook, very clearly laid out. It's, it's not block text, you know, for 400 pages. There's nice images and things like that. Um, very accessible. And although it does focus on the English situation, he does spend a lot of time talking about what's happening in Scotland and Ireland and gives you a Three Kingdoms perspective. And then Tim Harris's trilogy, Rebellion, Restoration and Revolution, um, are more kind of old school uh, texts, I would have, I would say. They are, you know, those block kind of pages, but they are very readable, very accessible and a great starting point. I'd also note that um, everyone should keep an eye open for uh, Karen's new book, which will be coming out in a few years, called Division and Union. And the idea of that text is to be a textbook for undergraduate students. And it will be, you know, that kind of that textbook style, uh, which will be very accessible when that comes out. But unfortunately, it's just not out quite yet. Now, there's also a range of digital primary resources, and we're very lucky for this period of, of history that there is so much available online and for free. Now, all of these, um, this is just a selection of kind of the ones that came into my mind when I was putting these slides together. There are more. Um, if anyone's looking for any specific things, please do feel free to drop me an email. and I'm, I'm more than happy to have a chat and point towards stuff. But these are fantastic repositories of uh, primary sources which could you know very easily be used within the class 
If anyone doesn't know what Internet Archive, it is the historian's best friend just now. It is a free searchable online library of uh, printed books, normally older printed books, but for this period, things like um, printed borough records, printed town records, you know, those kind of things, which were published in like, the early 20th or late um, 19th century. There's a lot of that stuff which is free and in scanned copies on Internet Archive and well worth a look. Historical text is a subscription service where so you will need to have a subscri uh, subscription to access it, but what it is is basically scanned copies of printed material and again a fantastic resource for teaching this period, especially the civil wars, where you can um, download PDF copies of uh, printed pamphlets and, and things like that and declarations. And again, very accessible to students because it's printed, they don't need to worry about things like paleography and it really gives them a sense of what information was like in civil wars and you know what it would have been like to go to down to the pub or you know go down to the, the, the church and hear these declarations being read out. Really a fantastic resource. The Scottish History Society has a number of um, really helpful texts and like information um, sections about a number of the topics covered in this course and it is really, really good. It also has references to a number of digital primary sources, which is well, well, with, well with a look. There's the map in the Scottish Reformation Project, which is just taken off and um, the full website isn't quite up and running yet. But essentially what that will be when it's up and running is a digital map of Scotland where you can click on any parish in Scotland and get a full uh, breakdown of, you know, the ministers that were there and the history of those people. And this, this is screaming out for things like case studies. So if you're teaching the civil wars and you want to find out what the civil wars were like in your area, this is a fantastic resource to, to do that with. If anyone wants to talk about Ireland in their, their teaching, the 1641 depositions, which are held by Trinity College Dublin, are a fantastic resource. They're all digital, all transcribed. And basically, these are all accounts of the outbreak of the Irish rebellion in 1641. So again, very accessible and very easy to use. Similarly, there's the English Civil War Petitions Project, which was funded by the HRC, um, which has a lot of uh, primary source material digitized and very accessible. But it's almost all of it is looking at um, the English Civil Wars. But again, very useful for topics kind of three and four. Scotland's People is run by the National Library of Scotland, which contains a mass of digitised material, which is really actually underused. But for our purposes as well, Scotland's People has just uploaded um, digitised church records. Um, so again, if you wanted to look at individual areas, so for example, if you uh, if you teach at Larbert High, which is my old high school, uh, and you want to find out what, what Larbert was like during the Civil Wars, um, you could find out if there is digitised church records and use them as your case studies. There's also the records of Parliament of Scotland, which is just an absolutely amazing resource. Again, fully transcribed, you can find out what Parliament was talking about in the covenanting period. Uh, you can find out, you know, the, how much does it cost to run a covenanted state? How much does it cost to run the army? These kind of discussions are all contained within the records of the Parliament of Scotland. Like I mentioned, the NLS has a, just a huge range of digital collections, so it's well worth going in and having a look. For example, they've got quite a lot of stuff on James VI and the Union of the Crowns which is uh, very, very handy. British History Online, again, is a searchable repository of information, uh, which has a lot of texts which have been digitized. Again, there's one of the, the British History Online ones very much, you need to go in and have a good recce and see what you can find, but there's a lot of good stuff there. This uh, Scottish Privy Council project will be taking off in the next kind of year or so. And that is a project to digitize the Privy Council records, especially post uh, the restoration post 1660. So again, for those later topics, uh, is, is definitely one to keep an eye on. And a really useful one is the University of Fordham's uh, source books. And they have source books for a range of topics, but there is one on, it's called Modern Constitutionalism and Absolutism. But a lot of the sources there are things like declarations from Charles I and, and James VI. And uh, again, all digitized, all transcribed and very handy if you want uh, your students to engage with primary sources. Now, very, very quickly before I finish up, um, just a shameless plug. This is some of the work I've done on, on royalism in Scotland, uh, the open access ones that have all links there. Um, and just, again, going back to this idea about how to teach this period, if you want to do case studies of certain areas, I've done a lot of work on that, especially to do with uh, clerical deposition. So that's basically where a minister has been kicked out of the church for doing something he's not supposed to. And in this period, it often means 
for declaring for the king. So through those records, I've been able to map political discontent essentially across Scotland and you get really interesting pictures and case studies emerge from that and from my work and alongside that you get very detailed accounts of things like why people are taking up arms for the king and why they reject the national covenant and in terms of regional studies you get really interesting pictures forming things like Glasgow and Ayr which Glasgow always had this reputation for being a bit of a covenanting city is quite clearly not there's a lot of political angst and, and division within the city and the surrounding areas and you get really clear uh, commentary upon, you know, the reasons why people are taking up arms in the Civil War. The one on the screen there is from Walter Balkenhall, who's um, one of the chief kind of propagandists for Charles I in Scotland, where he accuses the, the Covenanters of pretending religion in order to further a rebellion. So there's a lots of modern comparisons which you can bring out and talk to the students about in terms of you know, constructing propaganda and, and a political agenda. Just a lot of really interesting stuff, which I think converts quite nicely into these discussions. And just to finish up, this is just a list of good people to know. Um, these are all scholars who are actively working on this area. There's myself and, and Dr. Chris Langley, who are working on the civil wars. There's Karen, who you will already know, uh, who works um, on constitutionalism across the 17th century and especially uh, during the union debates. Uh, there's Dr. Laura Doak, who's currently working on the Scottish Privy Council project at Dundee. She does a lot on restoration, political culture and popular culture. And there's Dr. Stephen Reid, who works on uh, the Reformation in Scotland and has a lot of interest in James VI. And these are all incredibly generous scholars that if you have any questions about any of these topics or sources, just uh, reach out to them because I'm more than sure that they'll, they'll get, give the time and, and have a chat with you. So I've chatted for way too long, um, so I will open the floor to questions and have a little chat with everyone. Thank you for listening. <laughs>